Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to day two of making inferences slash drawing conclusions. Remember that we cannot do one. We cannot um, draw conclusions without first making inferences and kind of which kind of lay the foundation for a conclusion. OK, so today our learning targets are identify clues or evidence in a text that support a reasonable conclusion. We will draw conclusions by linking evidence to prior knowledge. We will make inferences to understand ideas implied but not stated directly in the text. And then we'll use academic sentence frames to discuss strategies. Now yesterday, or depending upon when you were able to watch the video, we looked at making inferences and drawing conclusions in a um, looking at a picture. And it was a picture of the cowboy and we had to figure out, we looked at, okay, we figured out um, he was wearing a cowboy hat and boots and spurs, and he had that long handlebar mustache, and he had the magnifying glass, and he was looking, he had a map. So we, we really looked into that, okay? And we, we, we looked at making inferences from what he was doing, and then we drew the conclusion that he was looking at the fine print in um, on his contract. Well, today we're going to be um, doing something a little bit different, and we're going to actually be taking the next step and not looking at a picture, but actually looking at a text. And we're going to be reading an excerpt from a, a very famous poem. But first, let's talk about um, drawing conclusions. Okay, remember a conclusion is a decision about meaning reached by analyzing clues or evidence. So we look at what what we can we look at different pieces and we pull out important information and important clues and then we put those clues together to come to a conclusion okay a conclusion is based on abundant evidence okay it is certain because all the evidence points to it so if there's four or five different things that point to one thing then that's what we're looking for if they have one thing and it kind of goes off into uh, into a distant land or a different way, then we want we don't want to focus on that. Now, if in our next section, um, in week two, we're going to be talking about what's called mysteries. And one of the things that mystery writers do is they give you red herrings, which is a clue that doesn't lead anywhere. Okay, but when we're talking about drawing conclusions, we want to make sure that all of our clues and all the evidence point in one way, in one direction. Okay, um, a conclusion makes sense given what the facts, okay, so given what facts you have and what personal experience you have, okay, so if you, you know, have limited personal experience, sometimes these conclusions are going to be difficult to come by. So it, it very much takes time and it takes some expertise to get to where you need to be, okay, and then authors expect readers to draw conclusions to understand ideas that are implied but not stated in a text. Remember, the author kind of helps paint a picture, but you have to fill in the rest of it. The author leads you to a certain point, but it's not going to finish. They're not going to finish the thinking for you. They, the author can't do everything. Okay, they expect the reader to come with their mind engaged and with with their prior knowledge and and really making sure that they're using the the reading strategies that we've talked about to really fully understand. And drawing conclusions is such an important thing because the writers oftentimes leave so much uh, out and, and it's very important that we are um, making inferences and then drawing conclusions from those inferences. All right, so today we're going to look at um, we're going to look at this poem and we're going to start off with um, we're going to have the computer read it to you just because I think you get tired of me reading things. Oops. I have to click on that. There we go.
All right. Um, sorry about the volume with that. Uh, uh, I think when I recorded it, I didn't have the volume loud enough on my computer, so I apologize. But don't worry. We are. I will read this. We will read several parts of it over again. So. Now, yesterday, when I looked at the Look Closely poster, I made inferences about what parts of the what parts of the picture mean. When I make inferences, I find one or two clues and think about the meaning they suggest. I'll show you how to do this. So let's let's reread the introductory paragraph here. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote the famous poem Paul Revere's Ride. The poem is set at the time of the American Revolution, 1775. The following is an excerpt from the poem. The introduction tells me that the poem is called Paul Revere's Ride and that its setting is 1775. Although the text does not say so, I can infer that the ride mentioned in the title is related to the American Revolution. The introduction also tells me that the poem was written by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I know that historic poems tend to give a perspective on important events of the past. I can infer that Longfellow lived and wrote after the American Revolution. Okay, so what I want to do is if we look at the introduction, okay, can you find clues that, that help them infer that Paul Revere's Wright is a long poem that tells a story? Okay, now hopefully you saw the word excerpt, which means a part of, okay, so it's this is an excerpt of Paul Revere's Ride, which is a longer poem, okay? So now, listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch, of the North Church Tower as a signal light. One if I land and two if I see, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and armed. The poem does not say who is speaking to children, but it does say, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. It also has a speaker who knows exactly what Paul Revere said in 1775. Okay, so if you think about it, how old do you think the writer of the poem is? Do you think the writer of the poem is a child? Or do you think the writer of the poem is probably a little bit older? Okay. Now, when we talk about drawing conclusion, we want to use some sentence frames. And these sentence frames are also in your packet. So if we go through these too fast, know that you will always have them with, not always, but you will have them with you. Okay, after reading this text, and this should say text, I apologize, I can conclude that blank, okay? Clues that lead me to this conclusion are blank, and then making inferences helped me blank, okay? now. Let's read this one more time from the poem Paul Revere's Ride. Henry Wadsworth, Wadsworth Longfellow wrote the famous poem Paul Revere's Ride. The poem is set at the time of the American Revolution, 1775. The following is an excerpt from the poem. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. He said to his friend, if the British march by land or sea from the town, town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the no North Church Tower as a signal light. One if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm for the country folk to be up and to arm. Okay, now, now think about what was just read. Okay, does the author tell you where Paul Revere's loyalty lies? Okay, and how can you figure this out? And these are all questions that are in your packet. So after, after you know, as we go through, after I read each question, pause the video and just jot down a quick answer as we go through. Okay, so hopefully you've paused it. Now, um, hopefully you saw that when they're talking about if the British march by, okay, that 
hopefully you, you realize that Paul Revere was on the side of the um, colonists at this point in time. Okay, now let's look closely to find clues that suggest whose side Revere is on. What does the author tell us about what, Paul, what signal Paul Revere will be waiting for? So again, pause the video, um, jot down a couple answers, and then restart and see how you did. Okay, so now not knowing what you wrote down, hopefully you went as you looked down and we looked at the um, the clues, um, hopefully you wrote something like um, Paul Revere wants his, his friend to let him know if the British soldiers begin to march. And if the British soldiers do march, Revere will warn people who live in nearby villages and on farms to take up their arms or guns and other things they can fight with. Okay, so what when we think about, um, I want you to um, answer the follow the next questions. What other clues suggest which side um, Revere is committed? Um, what do these clues suggest about Revere? Okay, and then um, what I want you to do is look start looking at what conclusions you can come draw up with Paul Revere's point of view about the British. Okay, so take some time, um, pause the video, take some time, and come up with w what kind of conclusions you can come up with. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully you came up with some conclusions regarding um, Paul Revere's ride, and some conclusions about when we talk about, um, you know, what does, you can, Paul Revere's, um, idea or kind of viewpoint of the British at this point in time. So as we look at this, hopefully the conclusion that you came to that Paul Revere is on the side of the Americans, not the British, and technically it shouldn't be Americans at this point in time, it should actually be colonists, and we've talked about this um, in, our, in our last unit. And Revere thinks that Americans, that the colonists should fight back if the British soldiers march into their villages or onto their farms. And what what you see is this is the this is kind of and, and it wasn't just Paul Revere, there was also William Dawes um, who all, and William Prescott who also made a ride. Um, and actually Paul Revere was captured, but the other two were able to make it to where they, to Concord. And they actually were able to um, hide, hide things and um, they were actually able to get the militia ready. And that kind of became the first, the first real battle of the American Revolution. Okay, so when we look at this, um, hopefully you see that you have your evidence, which leads to your conclusions. All right. So um, as soon as you're done with the video, why don't you make sure you answer the three big questions um, for day two. Why do readers have to make inferences about what they read in order to understand it? Um, how does drawing conclusions help you understand ideas the author has not stated? And then how do clues or evidence help you draw conclusions about what you read? Okay, and um, yeah, that one more thing. Let's just review drawing conclusions. Um, a conclusion is a decision about meaning reached by analyzing clues or evidence. Okay, we need clues to lead us towards a conclusion. Okay, a conclusion is based on abundant evidence. It is certain because all the evidence points to it. A conclusion makes sense given what the facts and personal experience tell us, okay? And it's a combination of the two that make it work. And then finally, authors expect readers to draw conclusions to understand ideas that are implied but not stated in the text, okay? It's the you and the author working together to make, to really understand everything that's happening, okay? All right, that's it. Make sure you answer the three questions and... Um, yeah, we'll be ready to go. We'll talk to you tomorrow.